The Roswell incident is a collection of events and myths surrounding the crash of a mysterious object in 1947. Right after rubber and metallic debris was recovered by Roswell Army Airfield staff, the United States Army claimed that they had their hands on a flying disc. Just a day after this announcement was made and made international headlines, it was retracted, but the word was already out. To hide the true nature of the find, the Army stated it was a good old weather balloon. But later in 1978, a retired Air Force officer revealed that it was just a cover story. At the same time, he added that he was sure that the debris had an extraterrestrial origin. This speculation became popular thanks to the 1980 book, The Roswell Incident. It also turned into the basis for long-lasting and increasingly contradictory and complex UFO conspiracy theories. Over time, they expanded the incident to include authorities hiding the evidence of other space civilizations, multiple crashed flying saucers, alien bodies, and even reverse engineering of extraterrestrial technology. However, none of those theories were based on any real evidence. But despite the absence of proof, many supporters of the UFO theory claimed that the Roswell debris was from a crashed alien craft. They accused the authorities of creating cover-up stories. This conspiracy narrative became a trope in movies, science fiction literature, and TV shows. No wonder that the town of Roswell is still promoting itself as the best destination for UFO-associated tourism. But what happened in this area in reality? The government's claim that a weather balloon had crashed at Roswell was indeed a lie. In 1994, the Air Force admitted that the recovered debris had actually been from an American balloon used to watch other nations. It was part of Project Mogul, an attempt to monitor anticipated nuclear tests that could be conducted by other countries. In 1997, an Air Force report called the Roswell Report, case closed, suggested that all those stories about alien bodies could have come from civilian witnesses who had seen parachute crash test dummies. The report also suggested that the witnesses might have combined several different events in their memories, the Project Mogul materials, the crash of test dummies, and a few other accidents that had occurred in the area. For many supporters of the UFO theory though, those explanations sounded like the authorities planned to cover up their interaction with extraterrestrial civilizations. After all, in 1947, the USA, as well as some other nations, was in the midst of the flying saucer craze. People reported seeing bizarre objects in the sky. They claimed those were spacecraft piloted by aliens. It was against such a hectic background that a rancher discovered some highly unusual debris near Roswell, New Mexico. The material included tinfoil, sticks, and rubber strips. The next month, he took his findings to the Roswell Sheriff. The man contacted the Roswell Army Airfield. After getting the wreckage, they issued that very extraordinary press release claiming that a flying disc had been found at a local ranch. The reasons for such an outrageous statement were unclear. In any case, the Roswell Daily Record picked up this press release right away, printing the story on the 8th of July with the headline, RAAF Captures Flying Saucer on Ranch in Roswell Region. That's when the military backtracked, announcing that it had been just a weather balloon carrying a radar target. That's a device that looks like a box kite made of foiled paper fastened to a balsa wood frame. The Roswell Morning Dispatch paid attention to this new claim and released a new story called Army Debunks Roswell Flying Disc as World Simmers with Excitement. It was the year 1952 when America first caught the flying saucer fever. A rash of strange sightings was reported in the skies over Washington, D.C. Were those unexplained radar blips, unidentified aircraft, or something much more outlandish? The Washington, D.C. sightings of the summer 1952 are also known as the Big Flap. But it all started in 1947 when a search and rescue pilot reported nine saucer-like things flying like geese in a diagonal chain-like line. Their speed reportedly exceeded 1,000 miles per hour. Within mere weeks, the sightings of flying saucers were reported in 40 other states. Later, the explanations were found. The sightings were either hoaxes or misidentifications of known aircraft and natural phenomena. But a few cases remained unexplained. By 1952, the UFO investigation unit called Project Blue Book had been founded. 
it was led by Captain Edward Ruppelt. He and his team would have continued to investigate a few dozen sightings per month, but for the April 1952 issue of Life magazine with an eye-catching headline, there is a case for interplanetary saucers. The article made quite a convincing case. It spoke about 10 unexplained UFO incidents, claiming that the flying objects were extraterrestrial in origin. According to the Washington Post, after the appearance of the article, the number of UFO sightings grew more than sixfold, from 23 in March 1952 to 148 in June. By July, the UFO mania was in full swing. All that was missing was a spark. And it happened before midnight on Saturday, July 19, 1952. An air traffic controller at Washington National Airport spotted seven slow-moving objects on his radar screen. They were far from any civilian or military flight paths. He called his supervisor and joked about a fleet of flying saucers. Simultaneously, two other air traffic controllers at Nationale spotted a bizarre bright light hovering in the distance. It suddenly dashed away at breakneck speed. At Andrews Air Force Base, located nearby, Radar operators detected the same unidentified blips. Those were slow and clustered at first, but then they raced away at a speed higher than 7,000 miles per hour. One Andrews controller looked out of his tower window and spotted something he later described as an orange ball of fire with a tail. A commercial pilot flying over the Virginia and Washington, D.C. area saw six streaking bright lights resembling falling stars without tails. Two jets were sent to search for the UFOs, but every time they got close to the locations shown on the radar screens, the weird blips would disappear. By dawn of July 20th, the objects were gone altogether. Rupert, the lead investigator of Project Blue Book, found out about the sightings just a few days later after flying to Washington, D.C. and reading news reports. He tried to get to National and Andrews, to interview the radar operators and air traffic controllers, but wasn't allowed to take a government-issued car. He had to fly back to Ohio with nothing. In a few days, UFOs were back over the Capitol. The same radar blips appeared again. Radar operators were wondering whether those dozen or so objects could be caused by a temperature inversion. That's a common occurrence in DC's muggy, scorching summer months. It occurs when a layer of warm air forms in the low atmosphere. It traps cooler air beneath. In this case, radar signals can bounce off the layer at shallow angles and create an impression of near-ground objects in the sky. To be safe, two more aircraft were sent to chase down the unidentified targets. The jets raced to a location targeted by radar, only for the blips to disappear. Eventually, one of the plane pilots saw a bright light in the distance and gave chase. But even though he was flying at maximum speed, he didn't manage to overtake the lights. At a press conference, representatives of the Air Force offered the public some easy-to-swallow explanations, having opted for the temperature inversion theory. After that, UFO sightings dropped from 50 a day to 10. One of the biggest questions that has been torturing the minds of astronomers and common folks is, why haven't we found aliens yet? You'd think with a universe so big and filled with tons of stars and planets, we'd have already bumped into some extraterrestrial neighbors by now. This question was first asked by famous physicist Enrico Fermi during a lunch with his fellow scientists. They were chatting about UFO sightings and aliens, and suddenly Fermi asked, where is everyone? It seemed like a casual comment, but it sparked a huge debate. If the universe is packed with stars, planets, and the possibility of alien life, how come we haven't seen any yet? This discussion gave birth to something we now call the Fermi Paradox. It goes like this. Based on what we know, there should be advanced alien civilizations out there, perhaps even many of them. They'd likely have technology that could allow them to travel across space or at least send us signals to let us know they're there. But here's the kicker. 
Despite all of our technology and all the searching we've done, we haven't found a single shred of solid proof that these advanced civilizations do exist. So where are they? Over the years, a lot of theories trying to explain this paradox have seen the light of day. Let's talk about some of the most interesting ones. The rare Earth hypothesis claims that Earth might just be super rare, and planets like ours, with life, are incredibly uncommon. In this case, we could be the only planet in the Milky Way harboring life, or at least intelligent life. We might also be the first intelligent civilization in our galaxy to reach this level of development. In other words, we could be pioneers, however unbelievable it may sound. At the same time, it's not very scientific to rely on a rare chance. Some people think that maybe advanced civilizations were once here, but left the Milky Way. Perhaps they developed the technology of interstellar travel, enabling them to fly between galaxies. Or they could use other exotic ways, like wormholes, hypothetical structures connecting disparate points in space-time. Maybe they found more interesting and pleasant places to live far away from us. One sad possibility is that when a civilization becomes too advanced, it ends up destroying itself. Whether through war, environmental destruction, or something else, it could be that most civilizations don't last long enough to reach out to others. Now, imagine an advanced civilization being wiped out by a disease before they could even start exploring stars. In other words, it's possible that civilizations just don't survive long enough to meet others. Another hypothesis, not very flattering to us. What if these aliens are using technology that we just don't understand? Maybe they're communicating in ways we can't detect, like using signals beyond our current understanding of physics. Scientists are discussing such possibilities, but haven't found any yet. Aliens might also be intentionally avoiding us. They could be out there, but staying silent, not so eager to reveal themselves until we're ready. Speaking of being ready, some people think that aliens could be waiting for us to reach a certain level of development before they make contact. Maybe they don't want to interfere with our growth until we're more advanced. Advanced civilizations could also go into virtual realities. And if they can live in digital worlds, they might stop caring about exploring the physical universe. Why bother? Another wild idea is that some civilizations might go into a type of hibernation, waiting for the universe to cool down because it might be more energy efficient to do so. And last but not least, there's this creepy possibility that our entire universe is a computer simulation and aliens are hidden from us on purpose. It's something like a video game that doesn't reveal all its secrets at once until you get to the next level. Now let's talk about the odds of life out there. We know that in just our galaxy, the Milky Way, there are probably around 20 billion planets that are roughly Earth-sized and located in the habitable zone, which means they're just the right distance from their stars to have liquid water. But how many of these planets actually have life? Could it be most of them, just a few, or almost none? And out of the planets that do have life, how many host intelligent beings with technology? In the 1960s, a scientist named Dr. Frank Drake tried to estimate the number of civilizations in our galaxy that could contact us. He came up with a famous equation, later called the Drake Equation. It looks complicated, but the idea is pretty simple. It helps us calculate the number of intelligent civilizations based on things like how many stars are born each year, how many have planets, how many planets could support life, and how long a civilization might last. Here's what it looks like. Let's look into this equation in more detail. N is the number of intelligent civilizations that could contact us. R is the rate of star formation in our galaxy. Fp is the fraction of stars with planets. Ne is the average number of planets per star that could support life. Fl is the fraction of those planets where life actually develops. Fi is the fraction where intelligent life arises. Fc is the fraction of civilizations that can and want to communicate. L is how long these civilizations last before they disappear. The problem is, we don't know the exact values for most of these factors. So when we plug in numbers, which we know with large errors, we get answers with very large errors too. Depending on the values, the number of civilizations in our galaxy could be anywhere from almost zero to tens of thousands. 
Right now, the best estimate we can come up with gives us a very small number, close to zero. In other words, even though our galaxy is huge, it's possible we're all alone here. Or nearly alone. One big reason we haven't met any aliens yet is that even if they do exist, we might not be able to visit them, at least not with our current technology. The speed of light is a hard limit in physics, meaning nothing can travel faster than it. This makes interstellar travel super slow. The situation could be better if there were exotic ways of travel, such as wormholes and warp drives. One day, they may turn out to be real, but so far, there is little hope for that. Even if we can't meet aliens face to face, there are still ways we might discover them. One of the biggest projects is called SETI, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. SETI scientists use huge telescopes to listen for radio signals from distant planets. If an alien civilization is sending out signals, we might be able to pick them up. And if we have a very powerful telescope, we might use it to take super detailed pictures of distant planets, maybe even Earth-like ones, hundreds of light years away. This could give us a whole new way to search for signs of alien life. In any case, even though we haven't found aliens yet, the search is far from over. Whether it's through new technology, better understanding of physics, or just listening to the stars, we might one day find that we're not alone in the universe. Until then, the question, where is everyone, keeps sparking curiosity. A shocking theory claims that mysterious comet Oumuamua might be a von Neumann probe, an alien spacecraft with broken engines tumbling through our solar system. It sounds extremely unsettling, but first things first, what is a von Neumann probe? Mathematician John von Neumann suggested the concept of self-replicating spacecraft that could in some ways mimic the features of living organisms or viruses. People started to refer to such hypothetical spacecraft as von Neumann probes. Von Neumann was sure that using self-replicating spacecraft would be the most effective way to perform large-scale mining operations, like mining asteroid belts or moons. The creators of such probes could take advantage of their exponential growth. Hypothetically, a self-replicating spaceship could be sent to a neighboring planetary system and look for raw materials there. Such materials could be extracted from moons, gas giant planets, asteroids, and the likes. Using these materials, the probe could make replicas of itself. The replicas could then be sent to other planetary systems, and the original probe could pursue its main purpose within its parent star system. This pattern sure does repeat the reproduction patterns of bacteria. That's why some experts think that von Neumann machines could be considered a form of life. There's also a theory that a self-replicating spacecraft could spread throughout a galaxy the size of the Milky Way in just half a million years, even if it used conventional theoretical methods of interstellar travel. In other words, it wouldn't even need to employ exotic faster-than-light propulsion. In 1981, mathematical physicist and cosmologist Frank Tipler argued that extraterrestrial intelligence couldn't exist because people had never observed von Neumann probes. Even if we take a moderate rate of replication, such probes should already be common throughout space. So, it's really weird that we haven't come across any of those yet. It might only mean that extraterrestrial intelligence doesn't exist. A response to Tipler's arguments came from astronomers Carl Sagan and William Newman. They pointed out that Tipler might have underestimated the rate of replication and von Neumann probes should have already started consuming most of the mass in our galaxy. Therefore, any intelligent race would avoid designing von Neumann probes in the first place and try to destroy any probes as soon as they found them. Another objection to the prevalence of von Neumann probes is that civilizations that could potentially design such devices have an extremely high probability of self-destruction before producing such a machine. In any case, the assumed capacity of von Neumann probes is unlikely in reality. But then, how about Oumuamua? These days, scientists are using high-tech scanners to examine a huge, cigar-shaped comet, which might or might not be an alien probe. One idea is that it's an extraterrestrial civilization spacecraft with broken engines wandering through our solar system. If that's the case, the object could easily be a von Neumann probe. Dr. Jason Wright from Penn State University thinks that a broken alien spaceship 
could move in exactly the same way as Oumuamua. Rather than moving through space like other space rocks, the 1,318-foot-long, 118-foot-wide space traveler is tumbling through the solar system. At the moment, it's traveling at a speed of around 200,000 miles per hour. In his blog, Dr. Wright says that if such derelict craft were not traveling fast enough to escape the galaxy, they could thermalize with the stars and end up drifting around like an interstellar asteroid or comet. They wouldn't have attitude control anymore and would eventually start tumbling. And it could distinguish them from regular interstellar asteroids. Plus, even though their propulsion was broken, their radio transmitters could work just fine. In any case, so far, it's just a theory. And further research is needed. What do you think? Is Oumuamua just a space rock or an alien space probe? It's the year 1977, and astronomers are stunned. They've just picked up a bizarre and really powerful radio signal coming from the direction of the constellation Sagittarius. The signal shockingly matches the frequency of neutral hydrogen. What's the big deal? This is the very frequency many astronomers believe might be used by extraterrestrial civilizations trying to communicate. Since then, the signal has become legendary in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, aka SETI, community. But what exactly was that mysterious signal? To understand this, let's go back to the 1970s when the Ohio State University Big Ear Radio Telescope was active. For more than two decades, from 1973 to 1995, it played a major role in the university's SETI program. By the way, it was the longest-running SETI project in history. And in 1977, Big Ear detected something extraordinary, the WOW signal. This wasn't just any signal. It was a strong, narrowband radio signal, right near the important neutral hydrogen frequency. The Big Ear telescope might be gone now, but the mystery of the WOW signal still fascinates scientists today. Imagine this. You want to tell an extraterrestrial civilization about humans. How would you describe our average height? We can't use feet or inches because these units mean nothing to them. Even here on Earth, we don't all use the same measurements. To communicate with other civilizations, we need a universal way of conveying information. Luckily, the emission of light by matter comes from an electron jumping between quantum states in an atom. This process governed by quantum mechanics, results in specific and fixed radiation frequencies and wavelengths, no matter where you are in the universe. Since we believe the laws of physics are the same everywhere, these wavelengths are universal. This makes them a perfect standard of measurement that any civilization could understand. For example, on the Pioneer spacecraft's gold plaque, we used a particular wavelength as a unit of length to describe information about humans and the spacecraft's origin. So, if an extraterrestrial civilization wanted to talk to us, they could have used the frequency of the WOW signal. And that's pretty amazing. The signal lasted the entire 72 seconds that Big Ear was tuned in. A few days later, astronomer Jerry R. Amon was looking over the data when he spotted the unusual signal on a computer printout. He was so surprised that he wrote WOW next to it, and that's how the signal got its famous name. The signal also has another, not so exciting name, 6EQJ5. Some people thought it might be a hidden message, but it actually just shows how the signal's intensity changed over time. The WOW signal sparked all kinds of theories. Some people believed it was a sign of extraterrestrial life, while others were sure that it was some interference from human activities. There were those who believed it could be a natural phenomenon we didn't understand yet. New research seems to have finally solved the mystery, but there's one thing we'll talk about a bit later. First, let's get into detail. A team of scientists, led by Abel Mendez from the Planetary Habitability Laboratory at the University of Puerto Rico at Arecibo, revisited the mystery using data from the now-closed Arecibo Radio Telescope, collected between 2017 and 2020. These observations were similar to those made by Big Ear, but they had better sensitivity, resolution, and polarization measurements. 
Arecibo detected signals similar to the WOW signal, but there were some important differences. These signals were less intense and came from multiple locations. The scientists believe that these signals, including the original WOW signal, can be explained by natural events in space. Their theory sounds like this. The WOW signal was likely caused by a sudden brightening of hydrogen due to a strong, short-lived radiation source. It could be a magnetar flare or a soft gamma repeater, SGR. A magnetar is a neutron star with a way stronger magnetic field than ordinary neutron stars. And an SGR is an astronomical object which emits large bursts of gamma rays and X-rays at irregular intervals. In any case, such events are pretty rare and depend on very specific conditions. But they can cause hydrogen clouds to light up for short periods. According to the researchers, what Big Ear picked up in 1977 was one of those bright hydrogen clouds in its line of sight. The study suggests that the signal's rarity can be explained by the precise alignment needed between the radiation source, the hydrogen cloud, and the observer. It means that the WOW signal may actually be the first recorded instance of an astronomical maser flare in the hydrogen line. Imagine you could travel through the universe by hitching a ride on space dust, meteoroids, comets, or even rogue planets. Wouldn't it be incredibly cool? This idea is known as panspermia. It has captivated minds for centuries, but despite its appeal, it hasn't gained much popularity among mainstream scientists. Mainly, it could be because it doesn't explain how life originated and isn't easily testable. At the same time, certain events have reignited interest in the theory, even among skeptics. And one of such events was the appearance of the mysterious Oumuamua in our solar system in 2017. Oumuamua was a mysterious object that zipped through the solar system at an astounding speed. It was the first interstellar object spotted passing through our star system and the first detected hyperbolic asteroid, an object with an orbit not bound to the Sun. Observations indicated that Oumuamua was likely to be a highly elongated cigar-like object. Overall, it was a very unusual object. Scientists couldn't quite pin down what it was. Some of them suggested it was a comet, others bet it was an asteroid, and there were those who thought it might be a chunk of frozen hydrogen. In April 2020, astronomers presented a new possible scenario for the object's origin. According to one hypothesis, Oumuamua could be a fragment from a tidally disrupted planet. If true, this would make Oumuamua a rare object of a type much less abundant than most extrasolar dusty snowball comets or asteroids. What made Oumuamua especially interesting to those who support the panspermia theory is that it was a visitor from another star system, so it was possible that it could have carried life across the galaxy. The idea of panspermia advances three stages, escape from a planet, transit through interplanetary space, and landing on another planet. Therefore, the Oumuamua hints that panspermia is possible. Recently, a new study titled The Implications of Oumuamua on Panspermia has seen the light of day. It was led by David Sow from Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology, an intern at Johns Hopkins University. The study explored how many objects like Oumuamua might exist and what characteristics they would need to transport life safely across the cosmos. The researchers considered different types of space debris, such as asteroids and comets, and estimated their potential to shield life from harmful radiation, particularly gamma rays from supernovae. If these objects weren't large enough, the intense radiation would sterilize any microorganisms hitching a ride. According to their findings, space debris made of materials like nickel or silicate could provide sufficient protection. But for a passenger to survive, they would need to have a minimum size of about 21 feet. The study also tried to estimate how likely it was that extremophiles organisms that can survive in extreme environments could have been delivered to Earth in this way. They calculated that roughly 40,000 objects of at least 33 feet in diameter could have impacted Earth during its first 800 million years. 
While this number might sound like a lot, the chances that Earth itself was seeded by panspermia are extremely low, less than 0.001%, according to the study. Interestingly, the researchers didn't just consider Earth as a recipient of panspermia, but also as a potential source. If Earth or another habitable planet ejected life-bearing material into space, that material could in theory seed other planets across the galaxy. The study suggests that under optimistic conditions, up to 100,000 Earth-like planets in the Milky Way could host life as a result of panspermia. However, many factors remain uncertain. For instance, the number of rogue or free-floating planets in the galaxy could significantly affect the panspermia hypothesis. Hopefully, when we discover more about these planets and the overall density of interstellar material, we will understand more about panspermia. The scientists have also underlined that the conditions in the galaxy were different in the past. For example, during an event known as the Late Heavy Bombardment, the rate of impacts on Earth and other bodies in the solar system was 100 to 500 times higher than it is today. If similar events occurred in other star systems, the potential for panspermia would be much greater. Despite its allure, the panspermia theory remains a fringe idea in scientific circles, all because of the many unknowns and its speculative nature. But as we gather more data from projects like the upcoming Rubin Observatory's Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, which is expected to detect many more interstellar objects and rogue planets, astronomers will likely revisit and reassess this idea. One of the best and most convincing pieces of evidence that extraterrestrial civilizations have visited Earth could be the epic Nuremberg space battle of April the 4th, 1561. It was recorded either in 1561 or 1566. Different sources provide different information. All the retellings of this story focus on the woodcut picture and a vague summary of events that occurred that day. The emphasis is always on crash spaceships and space battles. Almost everywhere you read or hear the story, it goes like this. The inhabitants of the city woke up early on an April morning and saw a staggering celestial show that looked like a real space battle. This story sounds even more convincing when you find out that some objects allegedly fought for quite a while. And some even crashed, you can see them in the lower right corner. Look at the picture once again. Orbs and crosses fighting, a giant arrow and bizarre tubes, crashing ships. Wow, that had to be a spectacular cosmic battle. To make it all more plausible, Hans Glazer, the artist behind the woodcut, was a very real person. He really did woodcuts, and this one is indeed from the time and place that it says it is, meaning it's not fake, and it does depict a real event that had its own witnesses. For all intents and purposes, it looks like very convincing proof of aliens visiting us, but don't get your hopes up. A superficial perusal of facts seems to confirm an extraterrestrial presence on our planet but the most likely explanation is much more mundane. The Nuremberg 1561 UFO battle is just an atmospheric phenomenon called a sundog or parhelion. A sundog is a concentrated spot of sunlight that can sometimes be seen to the right or to the left of the sun or even on its both sides simultaneously. Sundogs often appear as a pair of patches of light with subtle colors at the same altitude over the horizon as the sun. They can have a variety of forms, from colorful spots to patches of light so intense and bright, it looks like there are two additional suns in the sky. Sundogs are weird looking enough to make it seem that something scary and otherworldly is going on in the sky. At the same time, it's just our planet's atmosphere or ice in the upper parts of the sky acting as a prism or reflective device. This prism makes the light from the sun or moon do weird things. This image can help you visualize the phenomenon. Apparently, Nuremberg had the perfect conditions for this phenomenon to occur. If you examine the depiction of this event and compare it with modern pictures and videos, 
you'll soon realize that a sun dog is indeed a more likely explanation than the Galactic Empire paying us a visit. Let's find the proof of this statement in the translated description of these events and in the woodcut picture itself. First, the sun showed and was seen with two blood-colored half-round strokes, like the diminishing moon right through the sun, and in the sun, above, under, and on both sides, stood blood-colored and partly bluish, or iron-colored, also black-colored round orbs. Now here's the photo of a sun dog. It has a halo surrounding it, and a red orb. And if we have at least one red orb, there could be others showing up during other events. Plus, keep in mind that sun dogs are like prisms. So, depending on how light is reflected, there could be multiple colors present during such a phenomenon. Now, referring to circled plates mentioned in the description, those could be halos. For example, this sun halo looks vaguely plate-like, and it seems to be linked to other sun halos. And indeed, people have seen halos with multiple orbs. Some of the orbs could have taken a cross-like shape. If we watch some modern videos of sun dogs, we might notice that the orbs on film are sun-colored. But since the Nuremberg event happened between 4 and 5 a.m., the clouds and the sun could have had reddish and orange hues. As for the fighting, it could be as simple as one shape moving a bit and changing shape along with the movements of the sun. It could have looked as if it was pushing the other shapes out of the way. Do you agree with the scientific explanation? Or do you prefer to think that Earth was visited by guests from a galaxy far, far away? Write your opinion in the comments. In the middle of the previous century, flying saucers were constantly making headlines. America was going through a surge of reported UFO sightings. So, it shouldn't probably come as a surprise that the American authorities, namely the US Air Force, created a couple of short-lived programs. Those were Project Sign and Project Grudge, and their main goal was to look into that phenomenon. These programs were followed by likely the most famous of them all, Project Blue Book. It was a large-scale government study that lasted from 1951 to 1969. The initiator of this program was Major General Charles P. Cabell. He was a former intelligence director of the Air Force. Project Blue Book scrupulously gathered over 12,600 reports about people seeing bizarre unidentified objects in the sky. After thorough research, it was determined that most of those had natural, quite mundane explanations. As for the rest of the reports, the members of Project Blue Book simply didn't have enough data to evaluate them. That's why support for their efforts dwindled. Officially, Project Blue Book was closed in December 1969. But apparently, it didn't make American authorities lose interest in UFO sightings. Because in mid-December 2017, the world found out that they had secretly launched one more UFO research program in the late 2000s. Accordingly to certain documents, American authorities spent around $22 million over a four-year span on a project called the Advanced Aviation Threat Identification Program, aka AADIP. This project was started in 2007, and its main goal was to study UFO phenomena. Most likely, all this activity was triggered by the 2004 Tic Tac incident. That's when a few U.S. Air Force pilots spotted unidentified flying objects off the coast of California. They captured them on video. None of the pilots could figure out what these objects were. They behaved in a weird way, as if our laws of physics didn't apply to them. They were reportedly flying extremely fast and rotating in unpredictable movements. It looks as if after that incident, American authorities decided to investigate whether those objects could be identified or not. And if not, they were eager to know where they had come from and if they had been a threat. When the New York Times story about the new project broke, officials announced that the study had been terminated in 2012. Uh, however, there were people who claimed that the program was still ongoing. One of those was a military intelligence official running the program until they quit in October 2016. In any case, let's have a closer look at this mysterious program. Indeed, the areas of research funded by the project resembled things you could find in Star Trek. 
For example, one grant was for the study of traversable wormholes, stargates, and negative energy. This study was conducted by Eric W. Davis of EarthTech International Inc. Another grant sponsored the research of invisibility cloaking. One more area of study included warp drive, dark energy, and the manipulation of extra dimensions. This research was conducted by a theoretical physicist and director of the nonprofit Icarus Interstellar. As we've already mentioned, all these studies received at least $22 million of funding, but this sum could have been much bigger. No one has revealed why or how these studies were given such huge grants under the AATI program. The results of the study aren't known publicly either. The criteria for choosing these fields of research could be that warp drives and stargates might be useful for extraterrestrial civilizations traveling interstellar distances to visit our planet. Still, some people are not amused that such questionable fields of study were receiving substantial government funding. We fly away from Earth to look at it from a distance. It glows like a holiday tree. Big cities look like yellow spots at night. And during the day, we see strange structures, like a palm tree-shaped island in the UAE, or a dark band that runs all the way through China, the Great Wall. These are traces of human existence. Now let's point our telescope at other planets. Mars? It's just an empty, endless desert. Venus? Only rocks and volcanoes. Even if we look into distant space, all the planets out there are deserted and lifeless. Not a single trace of an extraterrestrial civilization. Many people are convinced that life on Earth isn't unique at all. Here's our galaxy. There are billions of sun-like stars. And here is the entire observable universe with billions of such galaxies. There's an almost infinite number of stars. And near each of them, there may be habitable worlds. But we may not have found life on other planets because it hides from us under the surface. For example, there's Europa, a satellite of Jupiter, slightly smaller than our moon. Its structure resembles a soft-boiled egg. Its surface is a hard crust of ice, but if you take a big enough drill, you can get to the liquid yolk, an ocean of water. Jupiter and its satellites are very far from the sun, so it's quite cold there, about 270 degrees below zero. So liquid water instantly turns to ice. But Jupiter has a strong gravitational force. That causes a lot of friction inside Europa, and its core heats up. The heat melts the ice, and we have a watery ocean under the surface. Water is the foundation of all life, so there could be simple bacteria in that ocean. And who knows, maybe there are other life forms out there. For example, weirdly shaped fish. Because of the weak gravity, their bodies are built differently. Or something like whales feeding on plankton. In 2009, scientists found a planet that is completely covered by an ocean, GJ1214. It's about 40 light years from Earth, and about 75% of its mass is water. Still, the temperatures on this planet are so high that water evaporates and takes the form of super liquid water. There's so much steam that it feels as thick as water itself. No life could exist in such conditions. But scientists have recently found at least 24 planets better than Earth and called them super habitable. These planets orbit distant stars in their habitable zone. It's the sweet spot at a perfect distance from the star. In our solar system, Venus, Earth, and Mars are in this zone. A superhabitable planet must be 10% larger than Earth and have stronger gravity. That way, it can have a denser atmosphere. A temperature 8 degrees higher than on Earth would make the planet more humid. This would encourage a variety of living organisms there. These planets may be great for life, but it's hard to tell if there is life there already. The main marker that would confirm the existence of an advanced civilization there might be radio waves. Imagine a habitable planet similar to Earth. In the process of evolution, intelligent beings appeared there, like humans. They're much taller because of low gravity, and their eyes are adapted to the light from another star, much brighter than the sun. Sooner or later, this civilization will have to use radio waves to communicate with each other. We can think of these waves as loud sound from speakers. Here's Earth. We're now actively using radio waves, and the noise coming from our planet is pretty serious. If a neighboring planet had radio telescopes, big dishes that catch these waves, they would realize that life is blooming here. There are many radio telescopes on Earth that are pointed into distant space, waiting for a signal from aliens. But we haven't received anything yet. 
Still, that doesn't mean there isn't a planet somewhere in the universe that emits radio waves. It's all about distance. We're jumping 200 light years to another star. Suppose there's a planet X where life exists. The civilization here is advanced enough to use radio waves, so they release the first wave into space. Our radio telescopes won't be able to pick it up until 200 years later. This also works the other way around. Radio communication on Earth has only existed since 1895. Our radio signal won't reach Planet X until 2095, and only then the aliens will hear our voice. But this radio noise doesn't stay for long. Every year, our technology improves and our radio noise decreases. We're beginning to use mobile communication, cable TV, and fiber optics. This all reduces the volume of our planet in the radio spectrum. And soon, it will simply become invisible to other planets. The same thing is happening on the other side. So, the radio waves coming from civilizations are a brief blip on the cosmic scale. And we can't accept radio silence as proof that extraterrestrial life doesn't exist. A giant telescope, which could take a direct photo of a possibly inhabited planet, would change the situation. We zoom in on the photo, and there it is! We see alien cities with tall buildings and lots of antennas. But now, we can't look that far away. We can take pictures of Mars and its satellites, and even their quality misleads us. For example, Sidonia. It looks just like a human face on Mars. We thought there used to be an ancient civilization there that made some sort of sculpture or memorial. More extravagant theories said it was the remains of a giant human. And there's a whole body of it under the sands of Mars. But in fact, it was just a hill. Strong winds blew out some hollows there. And when there was a shadow in those hollows, we took them for human eyes and a mouth. Or a monolith on Mars' satellite Phobos. We found a smooth rock there that was almost as tall as the Pyramid of Cheops. The news has spawned many theories about the civilization that built it, but it turned out to be no more than a rock. The infinite number of stars and worlds around them almost guarantees the existence of other civilizations. So why wouldn't they come to Earth, right? We think that life throughout the universe develops in similar scenarios. The emergence of simple life forms, followed by evolution and growth of a technologically advanced civilization. But just like on Earth, Cataclysms happen there too, causing mass extinctions. Meteorites, for example. Perhaps there was a civilization out there ready to go into outer space, but a huge meteorite, like the one that wiped the dinosaurs off the Earth's surface, made that civilization disappear, and life on that planet began a new cycle from scratch. In addition, the more advanced the civilization, the greater the risk of its self-destruction. Scientists might conduct experiments in machines like the Large Hadron Collider and accidentally create a black hole there. It would begin to swallow everything around it and grow in size. Soon, all the super-developed cities of this civilization and the entire planet would simply disappear. Another possibility for super-advanced civilizations is to travel through wormholes. Those are tunnels in space-time between universes. Aliens might travel through them and lose interest in going back. But it's also possible that life on Earth is unique. That's because our planet was formed thanks to a number of incredible coincidences. The first is the location of our solar system in the galaxy. In the Milky Way, there are constant fireworks of exploding supernovae. The radiation from these explosions destroys everything around it at great distances. Our solar system is right in the sweet spot of the galactic orbit where we're safe from such explosions. Another factor is the Moon. One theory of the formation of the Moon says that about 4.5 billion years ago, a meteorite the size of Mars crashed into us. If the impact had been straight, the Earth would have just broken apart. And if that meteorite had only scratched the Earth, the pieces would have just flown away. But the collision occurred precisely so that part of the meteorite remained in Earth's orbit and formed the Moon. Then, the Moon stabilized the Earth's rotation and heated our core with gravity. Only then, our planet developed a magnetic field, which protects us from the solar wind. Other scientists believe that life outside Earth may be biochemically different. Carbon and water are the basis of our bodies, but carbon could be replaced with silicon or phosphorus, and water could be replaced with ammonia or methane. These atoms could form molecules of different shapes and perhaps assemble into a living organism. Life based on such elements would be unlike anything seen on Earth. Black holes tearing apart enormous stars, pulsars spinning at incredible speeds and emitting powerful beams of energy. 
colorful nebulae with fireworks of newborn stars, galaxies of every possible color and size. All of these are found within our universe. But it's not infinite. It has a boundary, a literal wall. And beyond that, there's an absolute nothingness. Right now, we're going to make a journey to that wall. But first things first, our universe is like a humongous nesting doll. If you open it up, there's a smaller one inside. It's a galaxy. Inside that is an even smaller doll. That's our solar system. And the smallest doll of all is the Earth. Each of these dolls has boundaries that we are going to cross. For that, we'll need a spaceship and a big one. It also has to be able to move 100 times faster than the speed of light. You get on board and start the engines. 62 miles above sea level is our first boundary. That's 10 times higher than passenger planes fly. This point is called the Kármán line. It separates the atmosphere of the Earth from outer space. Now we fly further to the edge of our solar system. We turn on the hyperdrives and fly past Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. We've traveled a distance of 100 astronomical units. One AU is the distance from Earth to the Sun. And here's the boundary of our solar system, the heliosphere. Here, the speed of the solar wind decreases rapidly. First, it drops from 620,000 miles per hour to the speed of sound. Then, there's a layer called the heliopause. This is where the wind almost vanishes. And then, our ship experiences a bow wave. This is where we feel the force of the interstellar wind, which collides with the boundary of our solar system. When you pass this boundary, you find yourself in the dark of interstellar space. And here, you can find two human-made objects that made this trip for the first time in history. They're Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. Voyager 1 crossed that boundary in 2004. Voyager 2 did it in 2007. These space probes discovered that the heliosphere is not a perfect ball around the sun. Its southern boundary is 10 AUs closer to the star than the northern one. So, we're moving in interstellar space and will soon approach a stone wall around our solar system. 200,000 AUs further, and there it is. This wall of rock is the Oort cloud. In fact, it's a pile of asteroids that surround our world. Scientists speculate that the Oort cloud could be the source of comets and meteorites that fall to Earth, but they're so sparse that we easily fly between them. Now we're in complete darkness. The Milky Way is about 106,000 light years wide. In a conventional rocket, it would take billions of years to fly across that distance. But you throttle to the max. You masterfully fly past the stars and planets as if on a racetrack. And within minutes, you're at the edge of our galaxy. There's no more interstellar wind. All you see are bright dots somewhere in the distance. These dots are huge galaxies. We need to look at a map to make a route to the edge of our entire universe. You're here, near the Milky Way galaxy. It's part of a cluster of galaxies called the Linnea Caea Supercluster. But even this huge thing is like a little street in a big city. Zooming out, we find Hydra Centaurus Supercluster. Thousands of galaxies on the map look like little dots. Maximum zoom out! This is our entire observable universe. We thought it was infinite, but we may have proof that it has a boundary. It's here, 10 billion light years away from our home. Even if you travel at the speed of light, a trip there would take twice as long as our whole planet has existed. During that time, the sun will either fade away or explode like a supernova, destroying our entire solar system. And if you can live that long and then return home, you will see that our galaxy is there no more. It's long since collided with the Andromeda galaxy and merged into one big cosmic body. Luckily, your ship is able to warp space-time so that this journey will literally take a few seconds. Boom! Congratulations! You've arrived at your destination, the Eridanus Supervoid. Some scientists believe this location is the evidence of collisions of our universe with something big enough to leave such a large scar. The Eridanus Supervoid is an empty and cold space one billion light-years wide. If you think of this void as a cup, it would fit at least 10,000 galaxies. And it appeared after an accident of gigantic proportions. The object that crashed into our universe was... Another universe! Yes, other universes may actually exist. Imagine that our entire universe is a huge bubble that contains all the clusters of galaxies in the observable universe. 
There could be an infinite number of such bubbles. They could have been born during the Big Bang. These universes may be different from ours. They may have other galaxies and nebulae. But these bubbles could also be parallel universes. This means that if you chose cereal over oatmeal in the morning, in another universe, your twin would choose the oatmeal. Every choice you ever made in life had completely different consequences in a parallel universe. And because the number of choices are infinite, there's a whole infinity of parallel universes. So, like a regular bubble, our universe has a wall that is near the Eridanus supervoid. Long ago, another bubble flew past ours. As they approached each other, their gravitational fields began to interact. Our boundary wall began to deform and pull toward the other universe. The same thing happened on the other side. Then the walls of our universes came into contact. But as these bubbles moved, their connection began to break, and the other universe just ripped a huge chunk of ours. A cold void was formed at the point of collision, and that was the Eridanus supervoid. The problem is that the universe looks the same to the observer, regardless of point of view. For example, imagine a basketball hanging in the air. Now, if we put an ant on the ball and tell it to find the edge of the ball, it will start running around it, making an infinite number of circles. But the landscape around the ant will not change. All it will see is a rounded horizon. That's because the ball remains the same from any point of view. The same thing happens to us when we try to find the edge of our universe. All because we imagine the world in three-dimensional space, and our view is limited. For example, you see an ordinary square in two-dimensional space. But if you add depth and change the point of view, voila, it's a cube. If we could see the universe in four-dimensional space, a square might be something completely different. But maybe we can leave our home bubble. The key to traveling to another universe might be inside a black hole. A black hole is one of the most mysterious objects in the universe. They're so heavy, they warp not only space, but time as well. It's like putting a heavy boulder on a net. The net will sag, and the closer you get to the boulder, the stronger the curvature is. Once you're in the gravitational field of a black hole, you can't leave it. We still don't know what might actually be in the heart of a black hole. Some scientists speculate that white holes also exist. Theoretically, they should be born along with black holes. Except for the color, they're the exact opposite of black holes. Nothing can come close to a white hole. At the moment, there's no data on such objects, but general relativity theory suggests they do exist. There's also a theory that a black hole may be a passage to another universe. When you get into a black hole, you can come out the other side through the event horizon of the white hole. So you bypass the boundary of the universes and find yourself in a completely different world. But we may have proof that a white hole exists. In 2006, scientists discovered an unusual burst of energy somewhere 1.6 billion light years away from Earth. This burst was unique. It didn't look like a supernova explosion or even the merger of two black holes. Some astronomers believe it was the birth of a white hole. But because it was unstable, it was destroyed almost immediately. This process was reminiscent of the birth of our entire universe, the Big Bang. So, scientists called it the Little Bang. Thirteen point eight billion years ago, a mysterious explosion happened in space. It was chaos, a time when the stars, planets, asteroids, the rest of the space bodies, and galaxies were born. It was the Big Bang, a theory we all know about. But no one knows for sure what happened, where the universe came from, and what was there before. Some even think the universe went through a cycle where it contracted and expanded several times. In 1991, a cosmologist from Stanford University named Andre Linde had submitted an article with the main idea that there was a possibility the universe had been created in a laboratory. His theory said there was a chance an advanced civilization somewhere out there had created our universe. This civilization has made an entirely new cosmos that later evolved its own planets, stars, and intelligent forms of life. 30 years later, many scientists take this theory pretty seriously. They even started talking about things that we, as a civilization, can do to get to such an advanced level. The theory says this advanced civilization decided to add technology that helped to create a new universe out of nothing. It happened through quantum tunneling. 
It's when an atom can appear on the opposite side of some barrier, even though it's supposed to be impossible, considering the laws of physics of our world. Like if you wanted to pass a tall wall, but you can't pass it with ladders or go around somewhere. Imagine you can just walk through it like a ghost. In our world, it's not possible. But a more advanced civilization perhaps can do it. Plus, they realized how they could create new universes. Right now, on the cosmic scale, we could be a Class C civilization. We don't know how to recreate some things. For example, conditions on the Earth for when our central star, the Sun, goes out. If we manage to become a Class B civilization, we'll learn to adjust conditions to be independent of the Sun. That means we might be able to learn how to live even without it. And if we level up and become Class A, we'll know how to recreate cosmic conditions and produce our own cosmos in our laboratories. We think of the world we live in through three dimensions of space, east-west, north-south, and up-down. There's also one dimension of time, which means we can distinguish past from future. A fifth dimension would represent one more extra dimension of space. The theory of its existence was first mentioned in the 1920s. It was inspired by the theory of gravity by Albert Einstein, who said space-time is warped by matter and energy. We can't perceive these four dimensions, but we see how an object moves and attribute it to gravity. And maybe there's some other force, like the electromagnetic force, that's more than 1,000 times stronger than gravity that could explain things going on in that extra dimension of space. The fifth dimension is curved in a way we can't see it, but the idea about it was mentioned in a string theory. It considers the universe as really small strings of mass energy, not as particles. They vibrate in 10-dimensional space-time, considering six dimensions are rolled up way smaller than a single atom. That led to the picture of the universe as a 3D island that floats in 10-dimensional space-time. Also, the fifth dimension might be an excellent explanation to tell us more about dark matter. That's the invisible stuff with a mass, but we can't see it, nor can it interact with ordinary matter. And dark matter is 85% of all the matter in our universe. The universe can't be still. It's constantly in motion, either contracting or expanding. We used to think there were 100 billion galaxies, but it turns out there are more than a trillion. The galaxies are moving away from each other. This is what it means when scientists say the universe is expanding all the time. There are voids between galaxies that sometimes stretch millions and millions of light years across. They can seem empty, but they can also contain way more matter than we can find in galaxies. Still. Stars usually can't be formed there because the matter between those areas has lower density. But there are still plenty of so-called intergalactic stars. A good example is the Virgo galaxy cluster, 10% of which are intergalactic stars. We don't know how exactly they got there, but there are two possible ways. One, stars can collide, merge, or pass close to another galaxy, which can kick it off from its parent galaxy. Option number two, a supermassive black hole can accelerate a star to very high velocities if they have a close encounter, which can, again, make a star be expelled from its parent galaxy. If you could have a giant magnet, you could even pull something out from the vicinity of a black hole. That's possible if the magnetic field near a supermassive black hole is as strong as the black hole's gravitational field. But it doesn't work if we're talking about material that's already beyond the black hole's event horizon. That's a spot with a gravitational force so powerful, not even light can get away. You'd need to accelerate this material to the speed of light, at least, to get away. For that, you'd need an infinite amount of energy. But a magnet could help if something's heading toward the black hole but didn't get inside yet. When someone mentions a black hole, you might get a picture of some giant void in space but the Milky Way is most likely full of thousands of smaller black holes that float around the galaxy. When a star comes to its end, it will destroy itself in a supernova explosion, which is a cataclysm of energy. In that explosion, the densities in the core will reach an intense enough state that nothing will be able to escape. At the same time, the major part of the star explodes outward, but a part of it collapses inward, creating a black hole. The bigger the star, the bigger the hole. The black hole then swallows everything that comes in its way, 
including other stars as well. When a star gets sucked up into the black hole, it's ripped apart because of the strong gravity inside the black hole. Some of its parts fall into the black hole, while others get ejected at incredibly high speeds. Some black holes might have been formed in a different way. The early stages of our universe were, to say the least, pretty chaotic. It had high temperatures and pressures, and was in a state that shaped the entire cosmos. Under the right conditions, any old gas patch may have shrunk itself to become a black hole. And they came in many different sizes, from something that weighs a couple of pounds to giant masses like thousands of suns and those in between. They aren't really black. Black holes are areas with strong gravity and no object can escape when it gets inside. They feed off electromagnetic radiation such as light and space particles. Since they're consuming matter all the time, black holes give off a dark glow. The Earth is not that close to the inhospitable edge of the solar system. We're the sixth planet from it. Scientists made a pretty cool 3D map of our solar system where we can see what the edge looks like. It took them 13 years to design it. The boundary is called the outer heliosphere. It marks the area in space where the solar wind, which is the stream of charged particles our sun emits, gets deflected and draped back by the radiation coming from the empty region beyond our solar system. The inner layer of the heliosphere is where the sun and the planets have a rough shape of a sphere, while the outer layer is not that symmetrical. This asymmetry happens because our sun is moving through the galaxy and goes through friction with the radiation in front of it.